yeah we are live now uh, hello everyone uh, uh, welcome to this month's indic forum event uh, today's author is shri ganesh swaminathan ji uh, he is an engineer from iit delhi uh, he has had an interest in space science since school after completing his mba from iim ahmedabad uh, he spent most of his professional life in multinational organization in the field of technology he is currently pursuing a masters program in theology at the institute of vaishnava studies in florida so about 10 years ago he developed an interest in the puranas he was fascinated by the ancient text insights particularly the parallels to space science besides other texts he has researched most of the mahapuranas in preparation for writing this book that he is going to discuss today a uh, title from the beginning of time this book was published in 2020 and has sold close to 4000 copies all around the world uh, you are welcome to uh, buy the book i'll post the link in the chat um, is married and lives with his wife and daughter in singapore uh, but today is joining us from india uh, so having said that uh, the floor is all yours ganesh ji thank you very much akshay thanks for the introduction uh... Uh, good good morning everybody in the us and uh, good evening to those who are signing in from from india uh, thanks very much for making the time to attend this presentation and uh, thanks very much akshar ji and uh, uh, akshar and uh, shruti for uh, hosting hosting me on your platform uh, really appreciate it so uh, the book is about the puranas and uh, i think it's fair to say that not many have read the puranas and the few that have uh, and so most people assume it to be about stories of the devas and the asuras I, and it's hard to imagine that they contain any form of cosmology uh, many have read the mahabharata at least in its abridged form and uh, they consider it an itihasa of the great war and many know of the vedas as ritual texts right so this book explores the cosmology of the puranas right it's, uh, it's a different context but this presentation i've added some of and the book was released in 2020 so two and a half years ago and this presentation really uh, includes some work that i've done since the publication of the book and so it relates what we have what i have uh, what i present in the book to some of what we can find in the vedas and in the mahabharata as well okay so that's the overall view of the talk with that i will uh, go ahead and uh, share my desktop <clears throat> uh akshar can you see this uh, yes we can see this excellent yes so i will go full screen <laughs> so the title of the book is uh, uh, uh is called uh, from the beginning of time uh, an exploration of uh, and the is basically an exploration of puranic cosmology <clears throat> uh so quick introduction uh the word sanskrit word purana means ancient and puranas describe events deep within the earth's past right so there are 18 mahapuranas and upapuranas and the mahapuranas themselves consist of about 400000 verses so a huge body of work and they have been compiled by maharishi vyasa uh and conservatively dated to between 500 to 1500 ad by western scholars right many traditional scholars put it a lot earlier it is not a discussion on dating the texts <laughs> it is widely uh, assumed to be the largest collection of mythology in the world and it covers many different topics uh and i use i don't use even though i'm quoting the puranas i don't use any uh, devanagari script i use uh, the english translation and it's by a board of scholars it, it's been set up by the government of india uh and uh, uh in the 1950s to uh to actually bring the puranas out to the rest of the world <clears throat> so a uh, quick look at the structure of this presentation um it's explore stories of the puranas uh, but it focuses on specifics not generality so I, i don't want to talk about you know the puranas say this or the puranas say that we'll actually go down to what topic in this case the sun and we'll explore the verses that are in the puranas right literally the translations of the verses that are in the puranas and i'll i'll share with you the context 
and I'll let you make your own, uh, come to your own conclusions. <clears throat> so each story is explored in a few parts. It begins with the science. So the science gives you the context for the story. Uh, there's obviously the story from the Purana, and then there is the linkages to the Mahabharata and the Rig Veda. Right? So with that, we start with a brief modern day understanding of the sun. <clears throat> So a very quick introduction. So there is some science, but I'll keep it. So first thing is I'm talking to a fairly techie audience. I don't need to worry, but I'll keep it at a high enough level so that we don't get lost in all the details, right? So quick introduction. Um, the, our sun is the host star of our solar. So every solar system has to have a host star that basically it arises out of. And over 90% of the sun is hydrogen and the rest is mostly helium. And uh, it has two significant layers. It has a core. So it's a complex, the sun is a very complex and very well studied uh, celestial body. But for this discussion, we just keep it fairly simple. So there is a core, which has very high temperature and pressure. And here the hydrogen nuclei fuse to form helium. And then there is a shell where the energy is basically transmitted outwards, right? And so we have heat and light that we can get on the earth. <clears throat> so, uh, the sun is a star, just like billions of stars in the universe. And like all stars, it has a five-stage life cycle. <clears throat> uh, the five stages are birth. There is a stage of a young star, which is quite surprising, right? So there's this youth uh, stage of youth. There is a mature star that we see in the sky today. There's a red giant and there is a white one. And we will go through each one of these in some time, in, in an overtime. Yeah? So let's start with the birth of the star. <clears throat> So the most widely accepted uh, hypothesis for star formation is called the nebular hypothesis. And it says that these stars are formed in giant clouds of hydrogen, and they are called giant molecular clouds, GMCs, and they are named after the constellation they are found in. So here's a picture of the Orion molecular cloud, and right at the heart of it, you can see uh, the three stars on the belt of Orion here, right? So it's just called the Orion molecular cloud. And these are hundreds of light years across, basically. And these GMCs can stay unchanged for long periods of time, but some perturbation, uh, or whether it's a supernova or some other uh, celestial perturbation, initiates star formation. And what it does, it, it forms a ball of gas uh, due to gravity. So just imagine there is a cloud of gas and the molecules in one particular area start gravitating towards each other and they form a ball, right? And so it's localized in that specific region. <clears throat> So at this stage, it's a protostar. It's just a giant ball of gas and it, and it emits neither heat nor light. <clears throat> so let's see what the uh, uh, Puranas say about it. And this is a verse from the Brahmanda Purana and it talks about the birth of Martanda and Martanda is one of the names of the sun. <clears throat> so before I get into the verse itself, I want to orientate you to how I present it. So I present the verse, Brahmanda Purana book two, section three, chapter seven. And it also has the translator. So in this case, it's the board of scholars. Right? So anybody that wants to do any further research on it knows precisely where to go and find this verse so that you know, it's not, uh, it's not hand waving and, uh, and, and things like that. <clears throat> so it says, in the beginning, the Holy Lord created an egg within her belly. When it was taken out of the belly, it resembled a dead lump. Since he was born dead, Mrita, and, and as an egg under, Savitri the son is called Martanda by the learned man. So actually just, just a few verses, just a couple of verses. <clears throat> so um, if you look at the summary of this Puran, and this is mentioned in a few Puranas, not just in the Brahmanda Purana, but I just took the Brahmanda version because I thought it was very succinct. So the texts talk about the world, birth of the sun. It is under like a spherical ball of gas and it's mrita, meaning it's dead or inert. And so this is very similar to the description of the protostar that we saw, which was a large ball of gas. Uh, excuse me, there is just somebody at the door. So just one minute, I'll be back. Can you unmute yourself, please?
Is that okay? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> So um, a star is born from a cloud of gas. And you think of a cloud of gas, we think of what we see around us in the atmosphere. So a cubic centimeter of atmosphere, it is estimated, contains about 2.7 into 10 raised to the 19 molecules, right? So, uh, which is just air, basically, right? Uh, oops. What happened? A cubic centimeter of a gas cloud contains only 10 raised to the power four molecules. So about a million billionth of what we see in the atmosphere. So it's very, very rarefied, very, very rarefied, right? It's practically vacuum. So it's essentially, it's vast, dark and empty space with very little matter or light, right? And so um, in, the, uh, in the Puranas, it's referred to as Sarga, which is primary creation, which basically creating matter out of quote unquote nothing, basically, right? So once we have this for context, uh, we can explore this verse from the Rig Veda. And the Rig Veda has what is called the hymn of creation. It's called the Nasadiya Sutta. Uh, and this is creation in what we normally know as a ritual text. So this is the Rig Veda, Mandala 10, Sukta 12. And the translation is by Wilson, very old translation about a uh, more than a hundred years old, actually, but still very widely used. <clears throat> and it says, uh, the non-existent was not, the existent was not. Then the world was not, not the firmament, nor what which is above the firmament. There was no indication of day or night, so there was no light. And there was darkness covered by darkness in the beginning, and all the world was undistinguishable. So it's basically just nothingness, right? And then the sixth verse says, very beautiful, it says, who really knows? It asks a question before that, who created it says, who really knows? The gods were subsequent to the world's creation. So who knows whence it arose? So uh, this is just, just poetry uh, in the, uh, the regret. So very beautiful, uh, very beautiful verse. But this is normally just seen as a philosophical text, right? It says, okay, uh, it's just talking about it philosophically, but once you get the context from the Puranas of the origin of, of primary creation, I think it, it makes a lot more sense. Yeah. So uh, we go to the next stage, which is a young star. We talk about the young star and it's transitioning to the current mature stage. <clears throat> so this is the ju juvenile stage of a star, right? Uh, and it's called a T Tauri star. And it's basically a ball of gas uh, that continues to collapse, right? So this ball of gas continues to be driven by gravity and it emits heat and then light. And uh, it's extremely, it's very bright and it's extremely active and it's called a T Tauri star. So like I said, it's bright. It's very, it's characterized by huge flare, right? So the so first thing is that, uh, that uh, this, this huge ball of gas is going to collapse to something the size of the sun. So at this stage, it's like the size of the solar system. I'm just giving you an order of magnitude, right? And look at the jets of gas that come out of one of these things. So it's a, it's a wind from the T Tauri North Star. So it's huge flares, right? It's about a thousand times larger than the sun. And these huge flares, it makes the star look misshapen. It, uh, it looks, doesn't look circular anymore. And then uh, it transitions to the mature sun. So what it does, it, it continues to decrease in size because of gravity. And what happens is that the core temperature and pressure increases. So the temperature and pressure is the maximum at the core and the pressure and temperature there increases. And it initiates nuclear fusion. And uh, first, initially the hydrogen uh, atoms, the electron is stripped out and it forms nuclei. And then the hydrogen nuclei fuse to form helium, which initiates a chain reaction. It's a fusion chain reaction. And so the heat that is generated creates more, uh, starts more fusion, at, more atoms to fuse and so on and so forth. And so it creates a, a virtuous, uh, virtuous cycle, right? And so what happens is that the sun becomes stable, meaning there is a force of gravity that is causing the sun to collapse. And because of the, um, because the heat generated in the core of the sun, uh, the, the ball of gas wants to expand, right? It causes the uh, ball of gas to expand. And so it becomes this, it gets into this form of dynamic equilibrium. So it's basically this huge ball of plasma in almost a perfect sphere in dynamic equilibrium in space. 
And the flaring is now much reduced, right? It's, uh, it's a much tighter, much more compact ball of gas. And so the small, so as it, and so this is the mature sun, it's what is called a main sequence star. And so when, it, when you look at the transition from a T Tauri to a mature sun, the sun basically becomes smaller, it becomes less bright and it becomes more spherical, okay? So, uh, so there is a story in many of the Puranas, it's called the marriage of Samjana and Vivaswan. And it's a story of the sun being modified, right? Uh, this one is from the Brahmanda Purana again. <laughs> And so it's a long passage. It's about 35 verses. So I don't, obviously can't go through all of those in this session. I'll tell you the starting verse. I'll paraphrase the story. And then I'll tell you about the part where the modification takes place. <clears throat> so it says, originally, the form of River Swan was so refulgent that the ray spread sidewards as well as upwards and downwards. The gentle lady Samjana was afflicted by that form of the Lord of the Firmament. So for let me step back a bit. So Samjana is the daughter of Vishwakarma. Vishwakarma, one of the ancient gods and was considered the creator of the material universe. And Vivaswan was the sun god, right? And so it says that the original form of the sun god was so refulgent, refulgent meaning bright, that the rays spread sidewards and upwards and downwards. And we saw the, the gas, the jets of gas coming out of the, uh, the juvenile sun. And it says that the gentle lady Samjana was so afflicted that uh, she she was afflicted by the Lord, by her Lord. And so in another Purana, it says she could barely look at him because he was so bright. And obviously, so, uh, so she's not very happy with her marriage. And so after a while, she says, okay, this is not where I want to be. So she creates an image of herself called Chaya. And she leaves Chaya with, uh, uh, with, uh, with Vivaswan, and she goes away to her father's house, right? She's not happy with the way her marriage has turned out. So her, her father, Vivaswan, greets her warmly, and uh, but after a while, he says, listen, you've got to go and take this out with your husband. So it's not, it's not good dharma to stay in your father's house for long after marriage. So she doesn't know what to do, so she decides to go to... Um, the forest and uh, perform penance, tapasya. And she prays that her, son, that her husband, the sun, would be less bright and easier to live with, right? Uh, now, Vivaswan finds out after a, because of a turn of events that Chaya is not his real wife. So he gets a little upset, obviously. And so he goes to his father's house to Vishwakarma and says, you know, where's my wife? So Vishwakarma tells him that, well, your wife did come here. But uh, I sent her back uh, and, uh, and she's gone, basically. I sent her back to your place. So the Puranas say that the sun went into a yogic mode and uh, figured out that Samjana was actually in the, uh, in the forest performing tapasya. And she was performing tapasya that she would be less bright and easy to live with. At which Vishwakarman says, you know, I am the creator. I am the creator of the material universe. If you would like, I can make you smaller and I can make you less bright, right? And so I'm going to get to the worst now. Long story, yeah? So it says, thereupon Twashtra undertook to change the form of Martanda Vivaswan. He placed him on a circular moving wheel like a lathe and pruned the slices of the, slices of the irregular superfluous part of it, his brilliance. When his refulgence was taken away, the sun had his brilliance uprooted, i.e. reduced. So, um, so that's, that's the worst, right? So that's how it ends. <clears throat> so if you look at a summary of the passage, this young son is, very, is extremely bright and active and it's misshapen, but he becomes mature after marriage, uh, just like we expect most of our young, man, young men to be after, after getting married. <laughs> so the son is modified by Thrashtri in three ways. Its size is reduced, its brightness is reduced, and it's made more circular by removing its flares. And this is very close to what is suggested by modern science. So this is an amazing coincidence, right? Now we can look at the story of the marriage of Samjana and Vivaswan as just a, a divine, disagree, divine disagreement of domestic harmony in domestic harmony between some celestial beings, right? But which celestial being will get modified in size and in brightness at the end of to satisfy a disagreement. So you need to think about that. 
So the story is also mentioned in the Varaha Purana, right? And so uh, uh, here the son, um, so it doesn't have the story of Samjana and Vivaswan marrying, but it has the same story. Basically, the son is very bright at the beginning. And it says, uh, and he's prayed to by the devas. And so the verse says, this is the prayer. This is the first verse of the prayer to the son that the devas do. And he says, you are the first born in the world. You protect the world, also destroy it in the time of deluge. When you arise, you enliven the whole universe. We always bow to you. So they are praying to the sun, and the sun accepts their prayer. And he says, when it's extolled by the devas, the sun assumes a gentle form. So it becomes less bright, right? And becomes smaller. And it says it was at the Saptami that the sun became embodied. So the sun, the mature sun that we see in the sky today, assumed its body on the Tithi Saptami, right? If you there's a similar description in the Skanda Purana. Uh, the Skanda Purana is the longest Purana. It's about almost 80 some thousand verses. And it says additionally, it's on the Radha Saptami. And it says Radha Saptami falls on the seventh lunar day of Magha, when for the first time uh, the sun got into his chariot, right? So the sun became the sun that we saw, we see in the sky today. And Radha Saptami is celebrated in temples in the south of India as, you know, they take an image of the sun and they take it around the city, literally like the sun is going on the earth or whatever, right? And, um, uh, and in the north of India, it's not called Radha Saptami, it is called Surya Jayanti, which is the birthday of the sun. So it's actually pretty amazing. If you step back and look at this entire content that I've just shared with you, you start with the birth of the sun um, from essentially, say, uh, sp empty space, like Sarga. And you get to the, get to an annual festival performed by ordinary people right, that may have no idea or may not even be interested in the birth of the sun. But the science of the sun is firmly encrypted in the, in the, in, in, a, in a ritual that has been passed down over centuries. Right? I, I thought that was just amazing. And it is the Puranas that offer the link between between the science and the simple ritual. So the other Puranas mention it. So um, it's also there in the Markandeya Purana and it has some additional details that I'm not going into. Uh, there's a similar description in the Mahabharata. You know, we think of Mahabharata as the story of the Kauravas and the Pandavas, uh, but there is an addendum to the Mahabharata called the Arip Haribamsa. And in chapter eight of the Haribamsa, there's a passage of similar length, about 34 verses. Uh, that describes in as much detail the marriage of Samjana and Vibhaswan. The Rig Veda briefly mentioned this passage, uh, this marriage in, uh, in the Mandala 10 to 16, just a couple of verses, but Samjana is referred to as Sarnyu in the Rig Veda. Right? So, um, so you can see the continuity across the various texts. These are not isolated texts. Uh, they work across each other, basically. <laughs> So then we came to the current mature stage and um, I'm not going to spend time here. The text described the sons. There's a lot of detail in the Puranas. I'm not going to going into detail about it. it. It describes the distance from the earth to the sun which is about 150 million kilometers today as we measure it. And when you calculate in the Puranas, it comes to about 154 million kilometers. So quite, quite similar it calculates the speed. It also describes the water cycle, right? Um, centuries before it was known for body cycle. Right. The water cycle was known about, first proposed in 17th century and accepted in the early 19th century. And here is the Purana that describes it with real details. I'm not going to go into it, but just, just to let you know. So with that, we come to the last two stages, the red giant stage and the white dwarf stage. <laughs> so, um, so, so the hydrogen nuclei in the core continue to fuse with each other, right? So, um, after 7 billion years, all the hydrogen nuclei are converted to helium. And so all the hydrogen gets exhausted. And so now the sun can produce energy in two ways. So the helium nuclei in the core can fuse to form. So which is a, a big way to have two uh, as a proton and uh, can, can fuse to form carbon. And the hydrogen in the shell can now fuse to form helium because it's hot enough in the entire thing. And so as a result, the sun grows enormously in size, right? And, an and it, it becomes what is called a red giant, or an, uh, one example of that is the star Aldebaran called in the Nakshatra system as Rohini. And uh, Rohini or Aldebaran has only 16% more mass, right? So it's about 50 times, 40 to 50 times brighter, uh, bigger. 
and about 400 times brighter, right? So it's, a, it's huge. And just to get you a sense of what it means, I've got a couple of visuals here. It's schematics, basically. So this is the sun, the solar system, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and so on, right? So when it becomes a red giant, the sun becomes so huge, it actually swallows up the planets of Mercury and Venus. And it gets very close to the Earth and literally burns up the Earth, right? It's not that the Earth becomes hot. It, it just burns out. And this is not just a... This is not just an imaginary, imagined thing. There's been a lot of papers around this. So in 1987, there's a paper by a scientist called Jay Goldstein. And at that time, he suggested that the red giant sun actually engulfed the Earth itself. And then there was a paper in 1993 which said the sun's gravity would keep on decreasing because there are solar flares, which are basically emissions of mass from the sun. And because of as the sun emits mass, its mass decreases. As its mass decreases, the gravity decreases. And its gravity decreases, the Earth would move further away, and even though the sun grew in size, it would escape. And then there was a 2008 paper, so just about what, 15 years ago, which stated that the sun is this what is called a tidal attraction of the Earth. And so it wouldn't be able to escape as far as it wanted. And so the sun, at the maximum of the sun, it would just be enveloped by, uh, by uh, uh, the Earth would be enveloped by the sun. And, uh, on the visual on the right, you will see an artist's impression of the Earth. It is close to a red giant. It's not yet been enveloped. But you can see it's burned to cinder. I mean, there's no question of life. It's all black. And uh, you have huge pools of lava. Basically, they are either molten rock or places where the Earth's crust has broken and the, and the mantle below the Earth's crust has come out in giant oceans of lava on the Earth's surface. A very, very dystopic view of the Earth's future. But I mean, this is the reality. Right? So it's, fortunately, it's 7 billion years away, so we don't need to pack our bags just now. So let's say what the Brahmanda Purana says about it. And the Brahmanda Purana has a verse uh, describing the sun. It's called the Samvartaka Aditya. And the word Samvartaka means destroyer. And Aditya means sun. So it's basically the sun that destroys the universe. Right? So quite along the lines of what we just saw. And so uh, it says at the end of a thousand sets of Chaturyuga as well, and the annihilation of the Yuga arrives, the Prajapati begins to make the subjects abide in him. So a thousand sets of Chaturyuga is 4.32 million years, a thousand sets is 4.32 million years. So that gives you an idea of the time scales we've talked about. So then it says a continued drought lasts for 100 years takes place. Living beings deficient in strength become dissolved and get mingled with the dust. So these days we talk about global warming of two degrees and three degrees. Let's think of global, dom, global warming on steroids, so 20 degrees, 30 degrees, let's say 50 degrees, right? The atmosphere gets so hot that the clouds cannot form, right? So you need, you need a cooler upper atmosphere to, for the clouds to actually condense. But if it's so hot, the clouds won't form, and then there is a continuous drought. And then it says the sun that blazes in the sky is sucking up water, drinks water from the great ocean. So the water in the ocean start to evaporate for it, right? And then it says, being burned by the brilliant flames, the earth, including mountains, rivers, and oceans, becomes bereft of moisture and visibility. So even the water, molecules of water in the rocks, in the soil, and so on, uh, they evaporate and go into the, uh, into the atmosphere. And then it says, being restrained by the rays of the sun that burn brightly, the earth is enveloped entirely beneath, above, and all sides. So the earth, so the sun basically at its maximum completely envelops the earth. And then it says, getting the fiery splendor transmitted to it, the universe slowly assumes the form of a huge block of iron and shines it. So the, the earth literally begins to glow by the heat of the sun. Right? So if you look at the summary, it says that the timeline is similar to the sun's life. We saw the sun would become this in 7 billion years. So we're talking about same billions of years here. Uh, initially, it starts to heat the earth. The drought kills the plants and animals. It dries up the ocean. The sun then envelops the earth. The earth begins to glow. And most importantly, this is a description, but there are no, this is not a story. There are no kings and queens and daughters and fathers or anything of that sort. It is how a textbook would describe the sequence of events. So it's, a, it's pretty chilling, right? And so it's very close to what is suggested by modern science, right? And so we saw this exact uh, chain of events being reproduced, that being described in the Brahmanda Purana, right? So, uh, it's not just the Brahmanda Purana that talks about it. It appears in the Mahabharata. Again, we don't think of the Mahabharata as having passages like this. Right? 
So there are two times it gets mentioned in the Mahabharata in the Vanaparva. So, um, so Yudhishthira uh, hears this from the sage Markandeya in the Markandeya Samasya Parva. And Lord Shiva talks to Jayadrata in the Jayadrata Vimoksha Parva, right? And there are brief mentions elsewhere as well. So the Brahm Mahabharata also supports it. It's not just the story of the Kauravas, the battle between the Kauravas and the Pandavas. So with that, let's go to the next stage, the white dwarf stage, right? So uh, the core continues to undergo fusion, right? So first the, we saw the hydrogen becomes helium, then the nuclei of helium combine to form carbon, then the nuclei of carbon combine to form oxygen, and this carries on till it forms iron. And at, when it becomes iron, uh, the molecules, the nuclei are so big that the energy required to make the fusion happen is more than the or equal to the, the energy released due to the fusion. And so the chain reaction stops, basically. And so when the chain reaction stops, the, uh, the core of the sun, the sun stops producing energy. And so remember, the sun is basically in dynamic equilibrium. There's a huge amount of gravitational force that pulls the earth to the center. And there was all the heat that was being produced that was kind of pulling it out, right? Expanding it out. And when the heat production stops, it just collapses. And this collapse happens very swiftly. And so uh, as the outer layers of the sun collapse, they, they kind of hit across a core, right? And get bounced off that core and they form huge, uh, the material in the shell gets thrown out to form these huge clouds of beautiful gas, right? And so they are called planetary, they used to be called planetary nebula. And this small dot at the center, I don't know if you can see it in your screens, is what the sun would look, uh, the sun, the white dwarf sun would become. So when the sun was huge, its surface used to be right up to the, close to the earth. Now it's collapsed to, a, to a, the size of Jupiter, imagine, right? And it's not producing any heat. And so the planet, the planet Earth would start to cool rapidly. And the atmospheric water vapor starts to condense and it creates clouds and continuous rain. So again, let me give you some context here. <laughs> so so when, it, when the red giant sun is heating up the Earth, so think of it as the entire amount of water on the earth goes out into space, into, into the atmosphere. So the water in the rivers, ocean, ponds, lakes, in the ice caps of the mountain, in the polar ice caps, in underground aquifers, in the water, the water in the um, in, in the mud, in the uh, in the rocks. Just about every molecule of water on the surface of the earth is now in sitting in in, in the atmosphere as some kind of superheated steam. And when this, and when, when the earth starts to cool suddenly because of the formation of the white war, this entire mass of the uh, mass of clouds, mass of water in the atmosphere forms giant clouds. And let's see what the, I'm going to this time talk to you about the Vayu Purana. Right? And the Brahmanda Purana also has a, dis, uh, has a description, but I just want to give you a flavor in another Puran. So it's not just one of one order of the other. Right? And by the way, this is also there in the Varaparva of the Mahabharata. So let's see what the verse is. Uh, so these clouds are called the Samvartaka clouds. Samvartaka, again, clouds of destruction. And it said, the verse says, thereafter the terrible Samvartaka clouds begin to rise in the sky. They assume the form of shapes of herds of huge elephants and embellished with lightning streaks. The clouds then shower energetically and quell the entire inauspicious and terrible fire, right? So remember, what is the inauspicious and terrible fire? It is because the, the earth is still on fire, right? It's big, literally it's literally burning. The rocks on the surface of the earth are burning. So the first time when the, when the rain falls, it may not even hit the earth because it, it will evaporate almost immediately once getting close. But this because the outer space is cold, you will have the cycle going on again and again till it finally cools it down. And then it says, when over a course of 100 years, when the whole fire is quelled, the clouds that arise from the fire inundate the entire universe with large quantities of showers. So now what happens is that once the earth becomes cool enough, the water starts to stay on the surface of the earth, right? And so that's what happens. It becomes to inundate the entire universe. And then it says the oceans overflow their shores all around, the mountains crumble down, the earth sinks into the water. In, the, in that Ekarnava, the single bar sheet of water the mobile and the immobile beings get dissolved. When a thousand cycles of Chaturyugas pass away, it is called a complete kalpa. 
And this is from, um, and this is again, it's from the Upasamhara Pada. Upasamhara Samhara again means destruction. So it's basically the destruction of the earth as we know it. And now the earth is completely submerged. And so this is the pralaya. This is the pralaya that is there, that is described in the ancient Indian text. A pralaya is not a river overflowing its banks or, or something of that sort. It's the entire earth getting covered by what submerged in water. So you can imagine the amount of water that was there in the atmosphere that's coming down to earth. And it, the entire surface of the earth is basically a single vast sheet of water called Ekarnava. Eka means one and Arnava means ocean or water basically. So um, if, we, if we look at the Itihasa Purana and the life of the sun, uh, so we have science which talks about the life of a sun in five parts. It talks about birth, young stage, mature, red giant, and white war. And interestingly, if you see the same parts mentioned in the Itihasa Purana, you have the story of the Martanda, the inner star. You have the story of a young star, uh, Vibhaswar. You have the story of the mature, you have the description of the mature sun with the size, distance, and uh, water cycle. You have the Sambartaka, Aditya, the red giant sun, and the white war, which is the Sambartaka clouds in the rain that submerges in the earth. And then the it is over a kalpa of 4.2 billion years, which is the same order of magnitude as what modern science says today. That's an astonishing level of detail. Absolutely astonishing that correlates well with modern science. <clears throat> so I'm going to let that sit there for a couple of times. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is part of what rocked me when I read the Puranas. I had to read multiple Puranas to get to this point. And said, so I, I somehow, need, I am not a writer, but I need to figure out how to get this onto a, onto a piece of paper. <clears throat> So in closing, I'd like to leave you with a couple of thoughts. <laughs> so the Puranas are an ocean of knowledge. So it has many other stories and descriptions. It has the story of the origin of the earth's waters, which is the descent of Ganga. It's not just the origin of Ganga, but all of the earth's waters. It has a description of the earth, its shape, size, and geography. And that's the paper that I'm writing on right now, working on right now with my, with my guy, that's five master. There's a story of the great flood. It is a, and it has details about the solar system and neighboring cosmos. And so the book explores all these and other Puranic stories in the context of science. So you start with what the science says and just finds out, are these, are these just figments of the poet's imagination or is there some truth to it? And it's surprising the level of detail that we find there. So, uh, so I, obviously this session is to kind of get you acquainted with the book, but the intent of the book is, is to get you acquainted with the Puranas basically, right? And the Puranas does text of great depth and the cosmology is small but a significant part of it. And the Puranas illuminate both the Mahabharata and the Veda. So we have a richer understanding of both these texts once you get your head around the Purana. I'm not a cosmologist. I'm a self-taught cosmologist. Right? It just turned out that I had an interest in cosmology from school, so I teach myself and so on. Uh, but I would encourage you know, young people, people from all disciplines, not so up until now, all these ancient texts used to be read by Sanskrit scholars, right? Or people, oh, I'm going to read it when I'm 70, or you know, something like that, when I retired and stuff like that. This is not a retirement text. This is this is cutting its sides, basically. Some of these things have just been uncovered less than 50 years ago in a text that's over a thousand years old, right? So and I, I, want, I want more people, people that are trained in these, not just self-trained people, self-taught people like me to engage in these texts and unlock the treasures given to us by Maharishi Vyasa. Okay. With that, I, I have at the end of my presentation. I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you very much for your time. I'll hand it back to um, Akshay for uh, any moderation for some Thanks a lot. Yeah, we can uh, take a few questions. We have some time for questions. Uh, you can either ask yourself or even better, you can just post your questions in the chat and uh, we can take it up. I would like to ask, uh, not ask a question, but uh, um, dialogue a little bit with him. Um, excellent presentation. This is Dr. K. R. S. Murthy. Uh, and I'm also a cosmologist and original, uh, one of the early uh, scientists from ISRO, etc. Wonderful. And so happy to be able yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was a yeah. colleague of Abdul Kalam. And, uh, wonderful, wonderful to yeah. hear that. Yeah. Um, the, I have written about the stellar evolution that you talked about. 
okay. uh, uh, etc. have also heard detailed lectures on the Puranas. So I have okay. some understanding on the other side. Okay. Um, the Purana, do you by chance know who wrote all those Puranas actually? And if you don't know, I can explain, answer the question also. <laughs> so, uh, so the Brahmanda Purana actually has a verse describing it. So I don't have the verse handy with me. I can yeah. send it to you. Uh, it says it says very clearly, uh, uh, Vyasa Deva. Uh, yes, correct, correct. Vyasa yeah. Deva Vyasadeva. from uh, from the um, uh, from it, it says from folk tales, from the Kalpa texts, from folk songs composed the. Uh, of which he had a very good understanding. I'm, I'm paraphrasing that verse. I'm not doing justice to it, obviously. That's okay. I understand. Yeah. yeah, he's the person. So he himself says he reaches back into some ancient texts, compiles them, mm -hmm. and offers us the Puranas in a, in a more digestible way. Just like he gave us the Vedas in a more digestible way, he gave us the Puranas in a more digestible way, unfortunately. Right. It has not been gotten much yeah. attention. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Even after writing the, I mean, compo, he was the director and the comp, uh, the of the creation of the uh, Vedas. Uh, he was right, the right. executive uh, publisher, pr producer, so and director, etc. Uh, but uh, afterwards, yeah, Narada yeah, comes yeah. to him and say, "Then this guy is unhappy with all the great." Am I, uh, am I being heard? Yeah, yeah. And so what happens is that. Um, then he writes all the Puranas, uh, starting from Bhagavata. There are 18 Puranas that uh, uh, Vedavyasa wrote. Uh, just uh, incidentally, for people who may not know, that's not his real name. That's a title for what he did for the Vedas of dissecting and restructuring the dosa uh, thing. Vyasa means diameter of Esarto, for example. So that's what he did. That's the title. That's not his name. His real name is Krishna Dwai Payana. His name was Krishna, actually Krishna. Krishna means attractive, not black. People uh, have misunderstood the whole word and the etymology. Yeah, and uh, that's what he is. And I can discuss more details about how he got his name, what it is, how he became a, a Vyasa and all the Puranas. And there is a lot of literature available on Markandiya Purana is only one of them. There are totally 18 Puranas uh, that uh, uh, Krishna Dwai Palayana in the title of Vedavyasaru. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Amayank, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, uh, Ganesh, sir, uh, for this presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, I have two questions. So one is that uh, where can I know more about, uh, in an authentic way, the Puranas? Uh, for someone like me who doesn't know Sanskrit. And uh, my second question is uh, more specifically about the uh, the life cycle of the sun that uh, after the white dwarf stage, what will happen? Because in the Puranas, as far as I know, uh, having heard and read from some sources, that all, all the yugas and kalpas are circular. So what, what does science say? Uh, how does the circular nature start after the white dwarf stage? Yeah, these are my two questions. Thank you. We might have lost Ganesh Ji. I can explain from the cosmological perspective. I cannot be quote, I cannot be able to quote Puranas uh, verse by verse. But basically, all that matter now really gets rearranged back into the, the cosmos. Uh, and this is a recirculation again. And that's eaten up by another um, uh, another one of those in stars or different stages. Yeah, I think he came back. 
Ganesh ji, did you hear the uh, questions Mayank asked? Go ahead, uh, uh, Mike. Hi. Uh, Mike, uh, please, you might have to repeat yourself. Yeah, no problem. Uh, thank you so much, Ganesh, sir, for this presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, I, I wanted to ask two questions. One is that uh, for a person like me who does not know Sanskrit, how right. can I know authentically about the Puranas? Yeah. So first thing is don't worry about it. So first thing is there are excellent translations available in English. I'm happy to send you, I'm, I don't know, I'm happy to send it to Indic Forum uh, links to where you can find in good quality English translations of the Puranas, right? So that's take. let's take that off of the worry, right? And so that's the problem that we've always had. We've always ha assumed that you need to be a Sanskrit scholar to learn, the, to read the Puranas. And that's not the case anymore. I'm not a Sanskrit scholar. So just let me say it up front, right? I just, I just read the English and I even read it by some strange combination of circumstance and I, I don't want to go, to go into it now. So get that thought out of your head that you have to be a Sanskrit scholar, okay? So there are excellent, and in cases, multiple translations available for some texts, okay? But the, the, Pur the Puranas are all there in multiple languages. Hindi, I know the scholars, I can give you the references. I can give the same thing in Tamil, Telugu, Kannada, Marathi. It has been done by scholars like, for example, in our case, our speaker himself is a scholar, but he picked the English version. It's available in local languages. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. In fact, I think just to speak to the point that was being made, you'll find Kannada has a very good range of, uh, you know, oh, you can yes, go to a yes. website. Yeah. Yeah, you can yeah. just go I've to one website. All the Kannada versions of it, Telugu yeah. versions, Tamil yeah. versions, Hindi versions, because I'm a multilingual uh, person. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So one or two titles, if you can just recommend for a starter like me. Okay, I'd be very happy to. So I would I would suggest you start with the, I started with the Matsya Purana. I was just fascinated by the Matsya Purana and the Brahmanda Purana. Yeah, maybe you can start with those and see. And I, so I don't want to oversell this, right? Some people have an interest, some people don't have an interest. And, but I, my, at least if I talk to, 50 people, maybe two of them have an interest that they'll follow up on. And to me that those two people were not there before I talked to the 50 people. So that's, I mean, I'm a, I have a very low, I, I, I don't mean to say anything inappropriate to you. Some people just enjoy reading. I, I couldn't, so I'll give you my personal example. I started reading my, I read my first, started reading my first Purana 10 years ago. I couldn't read anything else after that. So I don't think everybody has to be at that level. You understand what I'm saying? I just couldn't read anything else for the next seven years. And then I had to force myself to read other, other stuff and so, yeah. So start with the Brahmanda and the Matsya Purana. Very, the Matsya Purana especially is a very readable Purana to my mind. It's very easy to, to my mind, it's a very easy should I look out for? Like, Ma, I will send it to you, my, my, I'll send you, I'll send it to, uh, I'll send it to Akshar and I, I'd be happy to, yeah. It's available on, I'll send you links so that I'm not, I'm not posting, stuff i'll send links so that you can download it yourself and there is no concern about it being pirated or something yeah. like that. So, if, yeah. my angie if you are a hindi hindi speaker and understand hindi i have a friend called dr ravi sharma in california he has I mean, the whole life a family like you know probably even dr swaminathan's family come from that background that's why you have you gravitated to I can give you all the Hindi links. You can even Google it. It's available. Right. These are on YouTube. So it's easy to hear them completely. And they give you references, but they may not give you the cosmological perspective that Dr. Swaminathan gave. Yeah. Thank you. And my second question is more specifically about the sun cycle that you were explaining. Yeah. So, uh, so as far as I have heard and uh, know a little bit yeah. that... Uh, uh, our Puranas say that everything is uh, circular and cyclic. So yeah. after the, uh, after the uh, destruction happens, yeah, uh, again the creation will go on in the similar uh, stages. Yeah, very true. So, so uh, you have uh, to read. Mayanji, you will have to read. Aapko to padna <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to give you the answer. Very good question. I, I have uh, uh, English, uh, Dr. Swaminathan. You probably know Dr. R. L. Kashyap, uh, who was a professor in USA, and he's a Harvard uh, graduate. And then 
Uh, uh, he was in Purdue for all his life as a professor. He's, I, he has written everything in English a translation. Oh, really? Uh, Wonderful. Yeah, you, uh, Dr. R.L. Kashyap, uh, he's originally from Bangalore, from National High School. Okay. Then he came and then he went back. He's giving lectures there. But his Wonderful. book is all in English. Every, all the Vedas have been translated to English. R.L. Kashyap. That stands for Kashyap Agotra. Yeah. So, so obviously, may I, uh, so may obviously I have... just a quick one. Obviously, if you read the, my book, uh, you will find the answer. But I'd much rather you read the Puranas because that's the whole idea, right? The idea is yeah. not just to read my book. The idea uh, is to get sir, to the Puranas. My question is not complete yet. Okay. So my question is that in the Puranas, we say that it is... Ah, Bajang, okay. Do you mind sitting down? Because it's making me dizzy watching everything around me. Okay. okay. <laughs> <Last> <laughs> question. No problem. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so Puranas are saying that things are cyclic. Yeah. And in the, uh, in the scientific uh, parallel, yeah. we, we are to the sun stages which end at the white dwarf stage. Correct. Correct. So how will it become uh, circular in the scientific perspective after Correct. the white Correct. So why should I tell you the answer? Okay. Either you should read my book or you should read the Puranas. Very simple. Okay. <laughs> okay. I don't want to tell you the answer. But I'm so happy you asked this question. Really. So you have to kind of go through. But very good question. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Any more questions from anyone? I will try and answer others. I, I don't want to kind of, I, I, I don't want to, uh, you know, to get the impression that I don't want to answer questions. I just think it's a very, I've never been asked this question before in all my presentations. And so I'm very happy. I just think he should read it and make up his own mind, right? I have, a, I have an opinion and I think, uh, mind you, if you, Read it. You might have a different perspective. I, I welcome that. I welcome people with knowledge of this, people with interest in this to sit down and these are huge texts, right? It's like, yeah. so sometimes I feel inadequate that I have, you know, with my training and my background of attacking these texts. So the more people that join and I think the better off, the more we'll understand these texts better. Yeah. So I hope you take it in the right spirit, Mayanji. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure, sir. No problem. Yeah. Anybody else? So if no one has a question, maybe I have a question. Um, so often we read Puranas and other texts and we see how, uh, how accurately it maps to the modern sciences view on cosmology. Uh, yeah, yeah. Some American scientists like Carl Sagan, etc., did show yeah. very short. Uh, Hindus had calculated this number so accurately uh, without any modern technology as such, or what we call Correct. modern technology. So, Correct. what is your personal view on how this they might have computed this, or how how did they develop this understanding? Understand. Uh, is, is was it pure intuition, or was there something else going on? So. I, so first thing is the short answer and the right answer is I don't know, right? So I just want to make sure that I understand. I also call it out in the book that I wrote, right? I, I say that there is a, we have to make a separation between the knowledge that we are seeing and the origin of that knowledge. Because sometimes, you know, you, you kind of think that if you can't understand the origin of the knowledge, it must be wrong, right? Or just an accident. You can't have an accident over five stages of the life cycle of the sun. If it's just one verse or something, you can say, okay, maybe you know, it was just a fortunate combination of verses or translation or something. You can't have this level of detail. And then there is everything, there's other stuff as well, right, that I haven't talked about. So the question is, there is obviously some knowledge. How did this knowledge come about, right? So I know that there is a bunch of, uh, I don't know what's the best way to say it. Uh, bunch of things that talk about in terms of aliens. I am, my, my personal view is that it's not intuition, but I think there is a lot that we don't understand about the human mind that, that the sages understood, right? And they, they had the ability of, through certain practices to, to visualize this. And I can't say it anything, I, and, I, and I can't say it because I don't know. I, I just want to be very explicit about this. 
Mm-hmm. But uh, that would be my hunch, if I had to offer a hunch, just a hunch, just a conjecture at this stage, that uh, there are obviously no measuring devices that can get you to this level of TPR, right? Um, so I, I think mm-hmm. they had some practices and uh, uh, spiritual training and things like that, that we are just trying to get our hands around now, right? Initially, we just thought they used to do yoga, which means pranayam and so on. But there's a lot more that once you read the Mahabharata in great detail or some of these other texts in great detail, they talk about uh, a different plane. And I have no experience of this plane. I don't think it's been recorded in modern science. Or, to be fair, I don't think modern science even has the vocabulary to discuss this. Mm-hmm. They don't even, if you presented this as evidence to science, science wouldn't know what to do with it because you can talk about the life cycle of the sun because they understand the sun, they understand it as a life cycle. There is a framework you can engage with science on. On these things, I don't even believe there's a framework. But that's my two cents. I, I don't know the answer, but that's where my conjecture is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your answer. Well, uh, so will, I add to that. Uh, yes, we'll take one last question from Mr. Kaushik Shah. Uh, do you want to go ahead and ask it, sir? Yes. Uh, hi. Uh, good morning, everyone. Wonderful lecture. I had a uh, quick question, a basic question, um, you know, uh, about the word Markandya and yeah. Markandya. So uh, somewhere it says M-A-R-T-S in Tennessee, Y-A, and then some places it says Markandya, M-A-R-K. So yeah. is that the same thing? Is it an upper branch or is it something uh, completely different? Because I have my daughter here and she asked me this question. I'm like, wow, that's a good one. So let me just Wonderful. ask. Wonderful. So first thing is uh, hats off to your daughter for spending her time to watch this. So greatly appreciate you and your daughter, Kaushik Ji. Uh, sure. Very good question. Uh, completely different. So Martanda is the name. The sun has many names. The sun has a name as Vipaswan, Surya, in fact, if you go into the Rig Veda, it has many names. One of the names of the sun at the time of its birth is called Martanda. And I don't know why it is, I'll be very honest, right? But that's the name of the sun. Sage Markandeya is one of the, uh, I think, immortals, right? So he had, so for right. example, yeah, in the uh, in the Mahabharata, um, Yudhishthira asks him, yeah, is that okay? Can I speak? Yes, please, please. Yeah, yeah. So in the Vana Parva, he asks him, he says, uh, Sage Markandeya, you have seen uh, the end of the previous kalpa. Uh, can you tell me how the current kalpa will come to an end? So he asks him that specifically. So he's not an immortal in terms of he lived a thousand years or two thousand years. He has lived through multiple kalpas, right? Multiple destructions of the universe. And he talks about, and so and so he talks about how creation starts again. So the Mahabharata to Mayanji, maybe Mahabharata is another place where you can go and learn about this. But you know, I'll, I'll leave that to you. And sure. so, uh, yeah. So um, and so he talks about it. So Martanda is one son at birth. Markandeya is a sage who has lived through multiple generations of the sons. So very different people, okay? very different entities. Yep. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. And one last thing, you know, uh, something very nice. Somebody sent me that, you know, the concept of AM, AM and PM, which is ante meridian and PM is post meridian, is yeah. actually uh, kind of stolen uh, from Sanskrit because in Sanskrit it says uh, Aroha Martandesa and uh, uh, the, the PM would be uh, Patana Martandesa. So it's like right. AM and PM is taken from there, but it's conveniently matched to ante meridian and post meridian. Just so uh, I don't I know. I was not aware of that. that. I was not aware uh, of that. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. And about um, Markandeya, he was the son of a Rishi a Maharshi called Murkandu. Murkandu's uh, son became Markandeya. Dr. Swaminathan, okay. we already know, but he didn't That's right. want to yeah. complicate right. details. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. Uh, Dr. Yeah, Sai Ramji, do you want to go ahead and ask your final question? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, good evening, sir. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you yes, very much. Uh, inspired us to read the Puranas. Yeah. Uh, to ask this basic question here. Yes. Uh, is there any uh, mentioning of the information about uh, different galaxies in the Puranas, sir? So I have not come across it. Right. So I just so one of the things that I've done, Sai Ramji, is that I want to make sure that I don't. So we've had a lot of 
claims that are not well substantiated. So I don't want to make a claim that I cannot substantiate fully. And I haven't been able to come across it. And uh, I have seen hints of it. And I would like to do some more work. But I'm certainly not there yet. Yeah. So I don't want to get ahead of myself and to claim it as this and as that. Well, if assuming that I get to that stage, I hope to show chapter and verse from the various Puranas saying, this is what it states, this is what the context is, and so on and so forth. I am just not there yet. So it would be inappropriate for me to comment. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Sir. Thank you very much. Sir. I think that's all for today. Uh, thank you, Ganeshji, for the wonderful talk. Uh, and also, uh, thanks to all our participants who uh, took out time to attend, ask questions, and so on. Uh, please note that uh, we have a Substack, so you can subscribe to that. The recording of this event will be sent on that, and all the future event notifications will come on that. So uh, subscribing to our Substack is one very good way to uh, stay in touch. Uh, also, like we like to bring authors on a book tour to USA, make them uh, visit different cities so that we have an opportunity to talk to them uh, face to face uh, uh, towards this goal and to support authors writing about the Indic subjects. You can also donate to us. The details of this are on our website, on our Substack, uh, and so on. Uh, you can also reach out to me for, with any questions uh, and so on. My phone number is given. Uh, on all our websites and promotional material. Uh, and having said that, yeah, thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you, Ganeshji. Thank you very much, Akshay. Thanks for hosting. And thanks again to everybody for uh, taking the time out today and listening to the presentation. Thanks. So much.